If you have your Bibles this morning, let's go over to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8 as we continue our series from this last book of the Bible. We're going to read this morning verses 5 and 6 and then bring out the rest of the text all the way down to the end of chapter 8. By the time we get to uh, the rest of the message, we'll go through that. Look at what it says in Revelation chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. Shall we pray together? Lord, we praise you for the wonderful ministry of music this morning. To pray, not I, but Christ. And oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in thee. And we praise you for that privilege that we have as believers to exalt the risen Christ, to ask that he would be magnified in our bodies, as the Apostle Paul said, by life or by death. Lord, today we're asking that you would meet with us and make your words precious to us. Help us to understand, help us to see, Lord, by the power of your spirit. And we do ask for your spirit this morning and his presence and his abiding work that we would truly magnify our magnificent Lord who opens the seals. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there anything that is quite so pleasant as a, a warm spring day by some cool spring of water that you can enjoy and treasure and hear the bubbling of the fountain, how relaxing that is? We know, for instance, that we find throughout the Word of God that beautiful picture of the still waters in Psalm 23, our Lord and our shepherd leads us by the still waters. We learn in Psalm 1 that the man who meditates in the word of God is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And it's really fascinating that in Jeremiah, recently we saw this in our Jeremiah series in Sunday school, that the Lord actually illustrates himself by saying, I am the fountain of living waters. And Jesus Christ talked about that living water. He talked about the fact that those who trust Jesus Christ, that, that out of them will flow this, these living waters. That's a really, really wonderful picture to contemplate as we begin this particular chapter here in Revelation chapter 8. But all of us know that sometimes those same precious fountains join together in a torrent and they come down with power, especially in a spring thaw with ice blocks, ice jams coming down through the mountains. Many of you here have been whitewater rafting and you know what it's like to go into a gorge where the waters come together in whitewater and white caps and you realize that's pretty turbulent when you get into the middle of that. And you're aware of stories like those that come about with Niagara Falls, people who've gone over the falls, that at times there are treacherous and precipitous falls at the end that make every one of us wary. The unwary souls who go into that river without paying heed to the signs and the warnings are very much aware later that judgment falls. Those of you who've been whitewater rafting, I think many of you have had this experience. I know that it's, I've had it two or three times where you'll be out whitewater rafting and the guide will pull the boat up to the shore and say, all right, all of you come with me and you will go, go to some place of observation and look down and see what is ahead. And the guide will say, now, here's the plan. Here's how we're going to go through this particular area, this particular time. That's the way I read Revelation chapter 8. It is almost like telling us that there is coming a time when judgment will fall. Judgment falls, if you will. And I'm picturing here a gigantic waterfall, a treacherous, deadly waterfall 
that judgment falls. You and I have to ask ourselves today, how do we see the future? How do we see life that is before us? As you can see from the slide on the screen, this morning's message is entitled, The Coming World Devastation. Right now, we are enjoying the free and precious gifts of our God. You go out after the service and go down to the water fountain and take a cup and fill it up with cool water and you begin to realize this is a gift from God. To walk outside and take a, a lung full of just delicious air, fresh air, it, it's a gift from God. Light from above, light around us, all precious gifts that the Lord has given us. We have to ask ourselves the question today, are we taking these these gifts from God lightly? Are we using these gifts in a way that truly pleases our Lord? So with that in mind, we're turning over to Revelation chapter 8, and we're recognizing that in answer to the prayers of God's people, as we saw in the last service, in answer to the prayers of God's people, these prayers go up like incense before the Lord, mixed with incense, and the Lord acts in judgment. He brings judgment upon the earth. Right now, things seem to be relatively calm, do they not? Yes, there are thoughts of, well, there might be, there might be questions about some violence this summer because of uh, various Supreme Court judgments or political movements that are coming about. But you say, generally speaking, I, I think it's really kind of peaceful. And it is. It is peaceful. It's like, it's like being by the still waters. But it is very clear in the Word of God that there are judgments ahead, that judgment will fall. You can see in Revelation chapter 8, as we saw there in verses 5 and 6, really the beginning, the very beginning of these judgments, that the angel takes a censer, this is a round golden bowl, takes a round censer and fills it with fire of the altar, and here's the significant part, cast it to the earth. And the Bible tells us that the earth, the whole, just imagine what this will be like, that the earth will be full of voices, noises, some translations translate that, of, of lightning and thunder and earthquakes. You and I know that lightning and thunder alone can really get our attention. And some of you here may have been in earthquakes in the past. And you know that every one of those are very unsettling. But here's what we need to recognize, that, that these words that we find here in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 6, these are only the very earliest indications of the judgment that will come. There are various studies that have come out about lightning over these last few years. And I remember studying this years ago, and they said that here's what they believe happens when lightning strikes, that it, it heats the air, and this would be the air and the moisture droplets in a lightning strike, to 30,000 degrees. More recent studies say 50,000 degrees. Folks, the surface of the sun is only 10,000 degrees, and yet these lightning strikes, as they come down for 30 microseconds, that's 30 millionths of a second, when those come down, they can be at times terrifying. On one occasion, I was uh, very intent on waiting outside for something that I, I really wanted to be next in line for. Lightning struck about uh, 50 feet behind me. I still remember feeling the hair on the back of my head stand up. There was a red-haired girl with long red hair, and her hair was sticking out in every direction as we all sprinted. My cousin, who outweighed me by 150 pounds, he was keeping up with me while we were sprinting toward uh, the place of shelter, all because a lightning strike and the thunder that results can really capture the attention. That's the kind of indications we have in this text when we read about lightning and about thundering. Thundering, we learn, is the expansion of the air and those water droplets. It produces a pressure wave that registers on our eardrum as sounds. It's about 120 decibels. If you're right close to a lightning strike and you hear the thunder, 120 decibels, that's right at the edge of the human pain level. So we understand from lightning and from thunder how they can bring about the fear of God in our lives and from 
all the testimonies we've seen over the years from various people, earthquakes can do the very same thing. It is likely that what we are seeing here in these next trumpet judgments, the first and ongoing, it's likely that they may actually be a result of the earthquake that it mentions in verse 6. Now, the deadliest earthquake in human history was in 1556. It was in Shangzi, China. And by all indications, 830,000 people died in that earthquake. They believe that that earthquake lasted between 7 and 10 minutes. And with that, that terrible, terrifying force, that's what happened. 830,000 people passed into eternity. There are disputes about this, but many of you remember the Haitian, the earthquake in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. They believe that 316,000 people died. That would make it second on the list. That number is disputed, but nevertheless, you and I, even in our own lifetime, we've seen indications of just how terrifying earthquakes can really be. And I think that what that does is it helps us to recognize something about this text of Scripture and what we are familiar with. That is, things that we know help us to kind of understand the unknown of what is ahead. What is it that we see in this passage? This passage bears a very notable resemblance to the plagues of Egypt. I'll try to bring this out as we go through these various judgments. But you know, for instance, there was a plague of hail in the plagues in Egypt. And hail comes out in this passage as well. We also know that there were plagues of uh, the various kinds of uh, difficulties. Fire came down, lightning, they would refer to it as. A lot of times in Scripture, when it refers to fire, like when Elijah's up on Mount Carmel and he says, let the God who answers by fire, they're talking about lightning. I mean, they're talking about this is what would happen in that situation. And so note that as we go through and recognize this. It, no one disputes, as far as I am aware of, no one disputes that those were actual physical plagues that occurred in Egypt. I mean, there was, there was actual hail, and there were actually firstborn sons who passed away in Egypt. And yet, it's very tempting for commentators to say, well, going forward, uh, these, are, these are symbolic. Uh, going forward, these are metaphorical. Yet I want you to note, if you have your text open there, that notice that John, the apostle, is perfectly capable of using language that is metaphorical. Now, you remember what a metaphor is in English, and a simile is a comparison using like or as. Notice what it says here in verse 8. He says, as it were a great mountain burning. In other words, did he say it's a great mountain burning? He didn't say that. He said, as it were a great mountain burning. Or look down at verse 10, burning as it were a lamp. Notice the word as that appears both times in that. And so we have to be really, really careful when we come to passages like this. And I appreciated Paige Patterson who takes a pretty literal view of some of these things and said, look, we have to admit that trying to, to really understand the exact nature of what's going on here, that's going to elude us. I mean, there are things in this text and we say, well, I think this is what it's about. But no one should walk away with the understanding of, well, it's symbolic, so nothing is going to happen. No, in fact, what you find in this passage is there are really affirmations of monumental judgments that will come. So with that in mind, let's open the first trumpet, shall we? You find it there in verse 7. And notice what it says. The first angel sounded, that is, blew the trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And here were the effects. And the third part of trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. Now, that earthquake that it described back in verse 6, that earthquake, what it actually produced, may, we may be seeing the results here. That this earthquake, and you're familiar with this, in what is commonly called the ring of fire around the Pacific, the ring of fire, sometimes called the circumpacific belt, 
you know that not only in the coastal areas around Chile, but also up and around uh, Indonesia, going up into parts of Japan, you remember the recent earthquakes that occurred there. Those are the very same areas that you oftentimes find volcanoes. This is really kind of fascinating to me when we've been down into Mexico and you ask, how were all these mountains formed? And they, they talk about how the plates, the tectonic plates would be pushed together and there would be like an upper thrust. Sometimes you're actually looking at lava, hot lava that is upper thrust and making uh, a mountain that way. Other times it's just basically the crumbling of plates, almost like you would see concrete piled up into various places. They told us down in Mexico, we were down there, that whenever you see one that's, that's basically pointed at the top, that's where the volcano did not go off. Other places you see where it's rather flat on top, they say that's an area that uh, probably the volcano has gone off. Now that's not, they, they could be right, and that could be exactly right, but you have to factor in the erosion, the kind of rock, and everything else like that. But generally speaking, just think about that, that when you see these, these pointed mountains, just consider in all the places where you have been, consider what it would be like to have volcanoes all around. And this is really the point I'm making here, that when you see these earthquakes all around this Pacific area, and you know there are volcanoes associated with that, folks, Picture what it would like to be, ha to be having earthquakes throughout the whole world. Listed here on the screen, you can see the various tectonic plates that they've tried to identify, geologists, those who study this have tried to identify. Just imagine if there were an, were an earthquake that would bring out volcanoes in, in all these areas. Now, some of you have been al alive long enough to remember, oh, there was a volcano in Iceland recently. In fact, I'll show you a picture of it here in just a moment. There was a, there was a volcano in Iceland, and it, uh, it affected airline travel between here and Europe. There were areas they had to avoid. I mean, they couldn't, they couldn't fly through that. And that said something about just what was happening in the atmosphere. Some of you are, are old enough to remember that there was a significant volcano that went down in Mexico a few years ago, and it affected the sunlight, it affected the, uh, the time for quite some time afterward, that you would go out and you would look out at the sundown, or, or sun, as the sun began to go down, and you would see, boy, there's just magnificent colors in the air, and all of those were little dust particles from that one volcano that had gone up down close to Mexico City. Picture, if you will, these volcanoes all over the world. For a moment, think about what that would say about air quality. You know that after Mount St. Helens went up, there were significant questions about air quality and people were being asked to stay inside during those times. Just think about what it says about air quality, what it says about sunlight reaching the earth and the other things that are involved there. I was especially fascinated to read about what happened there with this one volcano that I'm picturing here on the screen, Mount Rinjani. And what, what happened in that situation, they are now identifying, and some incredible photographer took a picture of this. This is not an artist's design, by the way. This is an actual photo. And you say, well, there's, there's lightning associated with it. I listed there for you in your notes. I would encourage you to go back and read it there's a very interesting entry on Wikipedia called volcanic lightning. Now just picture this for a moment. When a volcano goes up, is there water inside that lava? The answer is yes. What happens when that lava hits that water? It turns to steam when it's released. It's released into the atmosphere. And here's what we know about lightning. Lightning actually travels from water drop to water drop as it comes down. But here's what they're saying even more. They're saying that when that steam that's produced, when it goes up into the upper atmosphere and it reaches the point at which it actually cools and chills and turns to ice, that many times it will return to earth as sleet or hail. Now, keep in mind, keep that in mind as you're reading here. Look what it says in verse seven again of Revelation uh, chapter, it should say chapter eight and verse seven. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. 
Picture that volcano and these volcanoes going up all around the world. Hail, now we understand a little bit more about that. Fire, of course. And it says, and mingled with blood. Now, what is that all about? I, I really puzzled over this. I read an interesting article in the Washington Post, and it referred to what were called lavanados. Many of you are familiar with the tornadoes that come out of uh, forest fires. They refer to this as a lavanado, and, and what they're saying is it was a tornado that was associated with, I think it was on the island of Hawaii, a tornado associated with the, the updrafts that would come from a volcano, and it actually caused quite a bit of damage to the plants and trees that were all around there. Folks, picture in your mind what this will be like with this coming earthquake, this devastation that is all over the earth, volcanoes going on all around, hail and fire mingled with blood. We don't know exactly where the blood comes from. It could be that People, creatures, animals are, are taken up, and somehow or other they may even be on these various places where there's volcanoes. But you talk about something terrifying. I mean, this is the kind of thing that you would say, wow, this is the kind of thing I would expect to read like in a, a science fiction novel. And yet the Bible is telling us that this is absolutely true that these things really will occur on the earth, yet this is only the first trumpet judgment. As I said, this is very much like the plagues in Egypt. If you were to read Exodus chapter 9, verses 18 through 25, you would see how there is a real connection with those. Every one of these are warnings that the Lord is giving us before judgment falls. He's giving us these warnings to say, flee from the wrath to come. As I'll point out at the end of the message, one of the most significant comments, I think, in that whole series of plagues in Exodus is what the Moses said to Pharaoh. Moses said, he raised this question, how long will you continue to exalt yourself? How long will you continue to exalt yourself? You and I know that since the Garden of Eden, when, when uh, Satan's lie was, you shall be as gods, every one of us knows the temptation to exalt ourselves over and against that exaltation of mankind. Mankind was crowned with glory and honor, as we saw earlier in the service. He's crowned with glory and honor, but now mankind tries to become man-king and tries to exalt himself and tries to say, I will be God. And these are the judgments that actually result. The second trumpet judgment there is in Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. It says, the second angel sounded as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood and a third part of the creatures that were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. The scripture here says something like, or something as it were, a great mountain burning. Now, as you can well imagine, there are people who have really tried to study this and surmise and say, what do you think is going on here? And one of the answers has been, well, it would be like an asteroid hitting the earth. What would happen if an asteroid were hitting the earth? with our Hubble telescope and now the new telescope, we are much more aware of large asteroids passing by the earth more than we ever have been before in our entire lives. And it's just because we have more sensitive instruments. It's kind of interesting that when you see these things that would be coming from space, and the next one has the very same, next trumpet judgment has the same idea that something's going to happen. Others have said, no, no. What's actually being predicted here is that a giant volcano will blast its contents into the sea. Okay, whether it's an asteroid coming and burning in the atmosphere until it collides with the earth and comes into the sea, or whether it's a great volcano that crashes into the sea, just think for a moment about the impact of all that. We know a little bit about this because in the 2004 tsunami, we know that the wave height reached over 100 feet in the coastal areas. Where, when Harriet and I were in India, we were in Kerala, India. 
They took us one state south to Tamil Nadu and we went down to the very southern tip of India and we saw what's known as the Tamil poet. And here's what they told us. They said, when that, when that wave came through, some say it came over his shoulders, some say it came all the way over his head and hundreds of people died right there on that coast. In fact, what G.S. Nair and others did was they immediately formed orphanages associated with their local churches, and that's where many of their orphanages came from, right out of that tsunami. Well, that tsunami in 2004 killed 227,898 people, and it injured many more. The devastation described that in, their, in that description of 2004 is terrible. What is described in verses 8 and 9 is almost beyond imagination. I mean, let it sink in that you have these kinds of devastating judgments going on, and then, and then you have something like an asteroid or like a volcano crashing into the sea. One of the reasons this is very disconcerting is because here's what we know from science, and science is, science is a little iffy on this. If you go back for a moment to the previous note about the first judgment, there's not general agreement about how much oxygen a leafy tree actually produces. This was really kind of fun, kind of fun to try to track this down from various reputable sources. There's not a lot of agreement on it. There is general agreement that when it says uh, all the green grass, that is all the grass that will be green during that season of the year is all burned up, Here's what we know, a 50 by 50, and I put this in your notes there, a 50 by 50 patch of grass produces enough oxygen for a family of four for one day. And this says that all of the grass that will be green in that season will be burned up by this hail and fire mingled with blood. I mean, just think about the worldwide devastation. Now, on top of that, you have the indications of a huge calamity of some kind that will produce devastation in the oceans of the earth. Again, science is a little iffy on this. Some say 50%, some say 80% of the world's oxygen supply comes from the, comes from the oceans. It comes from the, uh, the plankton and seaweed and other kind of animals, other kind of uh, plants, I should say there, in that area, in the oceans. It also says that a third of the ships will be Pardon me, I think my mic's acting up on me this morning. That a, that a third of the ships will be destroyed. Current estimates put this at about 58,000 ships. If you, if you took all the ships, and then you have to define a ship as opposed to a small boat or something like that, but about 58,000 ships among all the nations in the world. In today's numbers, here's what that means. That means 19,000 of those ships would be destroyed. What you are looking at here when he talks about, and the sea became as blood, again, this is very similar to what you find in the plague in Exodus, Exodus chapter 7, verses 20 through 21, about the Nile River became as blood. What you are looking at with the implications for just being able to breathe, I mean, people just getting a, a lung full of fresh air, that in and of itself really comes into question. But wait, it gets even worse. Notice, if you will, that when he speaks here of the third trumpet judgment, you see this in verses 10 and 11. It says, the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. The name of the star is called Wormwood. The third part of the waters became Wormwood, or very bitter. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. The word it uses for star here is really kind of interesting. We, if you went back to uh, the Iliad written by Homer, uh, which is um, the reason we would even go back and look at that is how was, how was the Greek language used when, say, the New Testament was written? You would find that he used that word to actually refer to a shooting star or a meteor. Some have even said what if it were like a comet or something like that that would hit the earth? That, this is at the very least is telling us that a very large object from space will collide with the earth. And apparently it is so toxic, and some have even wondered would it be like radioactive, 
that a third of all the fresh water supplies, a third of all the fountains of waters that we love and treasure and drink from, all of those will be poisoned. You see what I'm saying this morning when I say when you go out in the foyer in a few minutes and, and maybe go to the water fountain or you, you step outside and, uh, after the service and you get a, a deep lung full of air that, folks, we are greatly blessed at this very moment by a God who is very gracious to us. And remember, he is blessing us even as rebels. Those who have rebelled against the Lord, those who have not been redeemed yet, the, who are still rebelling against him, he still gives us good things. This comes out in the book of Acts. He is still blessing us with refreshing seasons. But the scripture is very plain that those days are coming to an end. The Bible here uses the word wormwood. It's a reference to a very bitter uh, thing that, that would actually, I think it was actually used to, to help people to regurgitate or, or to basically try to heal themselves if they had some poison or something else like that. Uh, many of you remember that when the Chernobyl disaster happened, that the word that was actually translated for Chernobyl was wormwood. And so there's real questions here about what's going to happen, but this much is clear in the Word of God. A third of the life-giving water supply will fall into jeopardy. Just think about what that means for irrigation. Think about what it means for agriculture. The, these trumpet judgments, the Lord is telling us, are ahead for the earth. And there is a fourth trumpet judgment. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and a third part of the sun was smitten, a third part of the moon, a third part of the stars, so that the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. It's not really clear here in this passage if this is an astronomical disaster, and that is, is something blocking the light of the stars and the sun and the moon from space, or is it more atmospheric, brought on by uh, all the other things that are happening here? But the impact, again, is very, very significant. I mean, just think about this. Think about uh, the effect of not having enough sunlight on the crops. Now, I don't know about you and, and your garden this year, but uh, I was hoping it would be this kind of a summer, so we planted a lot of squash. I mean, we're kind of southern born and bred, so squash, acorn squash, zucchini squash, butternut squash, yellow straight neck squash. I mean, squash. And this time of year is the perfect, this summer is going to be perfect, it looks like, for squash just because of the amount of heat and everything else. But you see what we're depending on all the time? We're depending on photosynthesis. I think about this almost every morning when I go out into my garden and just thank the Lord for sunlight and for water and these amazing little creations that he has made that, that take the sunlight and the water and mix them together in various kinds of sugars in a process we call photosynthesis. Think about what it will be like when a third part of the sun is removed. What will this do to navigation? What will it do to the things that are going on in space, the things we use even now as satellites uh, that help us with our navigation? So as I say, th this is almost like you would read in some uh, science novel. At the very beginning of the Revelation series, I pointed out that the world today uses, especially in the genre, science fiction, the other things like that, they say it's apocalyptic. And when they say it's apocalyptic, what that means is it's disasters. But remember this, the word apocalypse actually means revelation. In other words, that which is unveiled. This is the unveiling of Jesus Christ as the sovereign Lord over all the earth. You say, but is it absolutely essential that these kind of things would go on for the Lord to rule and reign? Apparently the answer is yes. Apparently the rebellion of mankind is so deeply dyed within him that the Lord in his wisdom is saying, here is exactly what is necessary it is that Jesus would bring forth judgment upon the earth in the book of the Revelation. And so finally here you have this fourth trumpet, I'm sorry, the fifth um, the announcement there, the three trumpets, that there are three more trumpets to come, the threefold woe it is described. Look in verse 13. 
And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven. Some translations there have an eagle flying through heaven. Some have an angel. There is a copyist question there on which way uh, you should go with that. In either case, we know that it's a creature high up in the atmosphere making an announcement. I heard and beheld an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe. That's W-O-E. Woe, woe, woe. This is a threefold curse. Jesus used this kind of language when he said, woe to you Pharisees. Woe, woe, woe. Now folks, just stop to think for a minute about these first four trumpets and just how devastating they will be on all the earth and the cataclysms and the difficulties and the problems. I mean, things like, like fresh air and sunlight and, and sufficient water supply and agriculture. I mean, the, the earthquakes, the volcanoes. I mean, just think about that. And here's what he says in verse 13. He says, woe because of the three remaining judgments, the three trumpet judgments that are going to come to extend all the way up into chapter 11. If you have your Bibles just for a moment, turn with me over to Exodus chapter 9. I want to show you something that I think is really a really helpful commentary on this. We, we talked this over a little bit when we were studying the uh, back uh, last summer, I suppose it was, when we were talking about the message on Judas and we talked about the messages on hardening your heart Look at the question, if you will, that, that Moses asked Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 9, and verse 17. He said, as yet do you exalt yourself against my people? There, my friends, I think is one of the most significant questions that you would ask about today's message. All right, here's what the Lord was doing. He was bringing the plagues on Egypt. Why? because Pharaoh was exalting himself. And there are many, many contemporary illustrations of this. You remember that when the Nile was turned into blood, what does it say that Pharaoh did? It said, he turned and walked into his house. How many times recently have you seen political leaders when people are just really urgently asking them questions, they turn their backs and they just walk away. What the Lord said to Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 9 and verse 17 was, Pharaoh, how long will you continue to exalt yourself? Okay, take that concept now and put it throughout the whole earth that what you find is rebellious mankind, rebellious people. What are we doing? Exalting ourselves. Unless we come to repentance and crying out to the Lord and asking the Lord to save us, what we're living our life for is exalting ourselves. That last hymn we sang right before the message, not I but Christ be exalted. Not I but Christ. Lord, save me from myself, dear Lord. That's the real question that all of us need to be asking. What is it that the Lord is going to do in these judgments? I always get a kick out of it when somebody says, well, the Lord's trying to do this. Could I just pause for a minute and kind of talk about our wording there? When we say the Lord is trying to do this, do you think that the sovereign God, the sovereign Lord tries to do anything? I think he does it. And we try to understand what he is actually doing. Here he is bringing about this judgment. You say, but, but look at all the devastation. I mean, just the illustrations we use from Shanxi, China, and the earthquake there, and what happened in the tsunami that we know about in 2004. I mean, look at, look at the deaths. Look at the destruction. I mean, look, look at how many people passed away. It's really important. I put this in your manuscript for this morning. Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11. Listen to what the Lord said. Say unto them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn you, turn you from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? That's a very helpful commentary on this morning's text. Folks, it is not that the Lord takes pleasure in the death of the wicked. He's not in, not in heaven rubbing his hands together and saying, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to get. The Bible says he doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked, but here's what he does take pleasure in. 
He takes pleasure in repentance. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? The Lord takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But as we learned in the last message, there is something he takes great pleasure in, and that is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, that the Lord Jesus Christ offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. And Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 tells you that is like sweet incense going up before the Lord. That when you think about this coming world devastation, remember that when Jesus Christ was placed on that cross by cruel men with cruel hands, that the Father, God the Father, actually took great pleasure in the sacrifice of his Son for the sins of mankind. That goes up before him like a sweet-smelling savor, like an incense. And so it raises the question for every one of us here this morning. Will we continue to exalt ourselves? Will we continue to say, I will be God. I will be in charge. It doesn't matter about everybody around me. I will be in charge. I will be in control. Or will we do exactly what he tells us here in Scripture? To humble ourselves to recognize that God the Father sent his only son to be like a sweet smelling incense going up before the Lord. You see, here's really the issue. The issue is that judgment will fall. When John the Baptist was warning those around him, he, he used these words, flee from the wrath to come. Flee from the wrath to come, dear friends. That's the challenge of this hour. Before judgment falls, will we flee from the wrath to come? Shall we bow our heads together? Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you for the joy of this day of being able to contemplate and to carefully think through what you have placed before us here. Lord, I ask with everything else that's going on that you would give us still and quiet hearts Help us to be still and know that you are God. Lord, with all the things, the proposed violence we're hearing about this summer and all the difficulties and problems, I'm asking, Lord, that you would help every one of us to truly seek after you, that every one of us would seek to know you and recognize that Jesus Christ gave himself as a sweet-smelling sacrifice, like incense before the holy God so that we do not have to endure such judgments as will most certainly come on this earth. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm crying out to you today and asking that you would be pleased, you would be praised, that every one of us would come to the place of repentance and that we would flee from the wrath to come. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.